take my place. I wasn't worthy of it. I'm still not worthy of it. Shake a mother's hand before you're seated and, p and wish them happy Mother's Day this morning. Scriptures tell us that there's no greater joy than that our children walk in truth. And so... Uh, Mothers that have children that are in church today are extremely blessed. Amen. We're in, uh, we skipped a lesson because last week was our uh, children's church, Super Church Sunday. So um, we are uh, in this discipleship series about personal relationship and personal spirituality. And uh, we're going to talk about G when Jesus prayed this morning. So I think this is a great lesson. I hope I can do justice to what I studied this week about it. Uh, when Jesus prayed, um, and the lesson specifically is going to focus on before big choices. Um, it ought to be before anything we do. Isn't I think it's Ephesians six eighteen. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's Ephesians six eighteen that says that. In all things, uh, with all prayer and supplication, that we submit our petitions to God, um, everything that we do should begin with prayer. I'm not sure why, whenever we say, this good, uh, this good pastor lesson this morning, uh, I'm not sure why when we say we're going to have a prayer meeting that people think, oh, it's just prayer meeting, I don't need to go to that. Or why when we say we're going to have prayer, it's just a deal where people don't seem to um, want to come to prayer. They're uncomfortable in corporate prayer or even maybe even, I guess, private prayer. Um, and I'm going to make some statements this morning uh, not to lift up my wife or I, but just to bear out facts to you, and not because I'm the pastor, but because I want to be a disciple. Um, we don't buy a car unless we pray about it. Um, we don't pray about where we should go eat dinner. We don't ask God to direct us. If, he, if I did, I'm afraid he'd tell me I shouldn't eat at some of the places I eat because they give me heartburn. So I don't ask God where I should go eat. But we do, every time we eat, ask God to bless the food that we put in our mouth. So I think prayer is an important part of our lives, and we should not shun from prayer. Book of Luke, this is where the, the theme for what we're going to talk about this morning, came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve 
whom also he named apostles, Simon, whom he also named Peter, Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelotes. So uh, it, it was probably a pivotal moment in Jesus' life. I, you know, the Bible doesn't get into great detail, and we, we think of Jesus, we think of him as the Messiah, and so he was God manifest in flesh, right? And so we spend uh, a lot of our time thinking of him as God manifest in the flesh instead of God manifest in the flesh. Follow me, my, my, my focus? Because the Bible tells us he was tempted in all points, just like we were. So he was flesh. So he suffered the same fleshly things that you and I suffer. He got hungry. He got tired. Jesus got angry. Jesus got angry. He got weary. He got frustrated. The stress of the day, the constant pulling of people at him, people every day wanting him to do things for them because he was this magic Jesus. All that got to him. We don't think about that because he was God manifest in flesh. But he was God manifest in the flesh. So he suffered from all of that. So this probably was kind of a stressful time. It was the Sabbath day. He just healed the man with a withered hand, right? If you read your Bible, you know that. And uh, it should have been a cause for celebration, but the man could barely get his hand stretched out when the, Fer the Sadducees and uh, the Pharisees were all accusing him of healing somebody on the Sabbath day. Who does he think he is? What in the world's going on? And so Jesus needed an escape. He needed a time away. His body was weary. He's emotionally distraught. And he was stretched to the limit. And so he wanted some time away. And the Bible tells us that he looked off and he saw the mountains. And he went off. In his time of stress, he went off to pray. Jesus went to pray. And the Bible said that he prayed all night long. And then the next day is when he uh, called the 12 out of the followers that had followed him. We've all got times in our lives, everything seems to be going fine, and then all of a sudden, a phone call or a check of the bank account or one of the kids comes home unexpectedly or whatever happens, and we've got challenges that we have to face. We become physically, emotionally, and spiritually drained. Our initial feeling usually is fear or panic. You know, when something out of the ordinary, something that we've tried to put behind us, something that we try to block or hide comes at us, our initial feeling is usually fear, panic, or dread, right? We're afraid. Our minds begin to run rampant with the worst case scenario that can happen. And not everybody is that way, but most people are. When something uh, opens up that you're not in control, I like to be in control. I like to be in charge. My wife likes to be in charge a little more than I do. So we butt heads sometimes. Sometimes we butt heads because we both want to be in charge. But when something comes up, that's not in the plan, it can, it can bring panic or fear or dread, you know. We wonder what in the world's going to happen. And um, you start thinking about, oh, my Lord, this is going to be the worst day I've had in 20 years because this came up, right? We, that's not, I'm not, I'm not being critical. I'm not, I, I do the same thing. We all do it. We all do it. It's just what we do. It's the way we react when, we, when things happen. We've got to determine how to handle the situation that we're facing. And knowing that we've got to make a decision, and sometimes knowing that we've got to make a decision quickly, can many times leave us confused as, it, as to exactly what the right decision is. What should I do here? Our first inclination might be to reach out to a friend or to a family member to get advice. Some people might go to social media. 
post on social media, what a rotten day I'm having, this and this and this is going on. And uh, then all of the people chime in with their memes and their, is it GIFs or GIFs? I don't know which it is, but the, I don't know how you say the G-I-F. Is that, a, is that a GIF or a GIF? Somebody that's smarter than me needs to let me know what that is. But the, all these people chime in. It tickles me. My favorite part of social media is reading people who put all of their junk on social media and watching everybody else chime in on it. I just think that's hilarious. World Wide Web. It's the World Wide Web. Everybody sees you whine on social media. Quit whining on social media. It's Anyway, that's just me. I, I, that, me up on a soapbox. That's not preaching. That's not teaching. That's probably not even smart. But nonetheless, it's social media. It's the World Wide Web. People, everybody sees that. Uh, some people don't know. Here's the problem with whining on social media. Some people don't really know how to react to that. And so they just avoid you like the plague. And then what they do is then when they see that that's what you do on social media, then they avoid you in person. And then you wonder, why don't they have anything to do with me? They don't like me. It's not that they don't like you. They don't know how to react. Because they have their own bad times, and they have their own bad days, and they have their own problems, and they don't know what's going on in their lives. And then when they're around somebody who, from perception, because perception is reality, from their perception is whining all the time, I just can't deal with that. There are people whose lives are, I just can't deal with that, because there's so much going on in their lives, right? Right? So anyway, that, that was just me. Now I'm going to get back behind. Oh, so, so that was just Terry talking, but now I'm going to get back behind the pulpit and we're going to get back to the lesson, all right? So Jesus has done all of this, right? He's doing all of this, and, and um, he's facing the same things that we face. We all have this inclination, and, and, and we don't know what we're going to do. But there are far better ways for us to get answers to the questions that we have in life than asking family, and there's nothing wrong with asking family, asking friends, popping it on social media. Jesus gave us an example of what we should do when we've got decisions in our life that have to be made. Uh, Webster, to get back to a more spiritual aspect, Webster defines prayer as a, a petition to God in word or thought. The Word of God talks about prayer from Genesis to Revelation. In the Garden of Eden, Adam communed with God every day, and he communed with God through prayer. In the book of Revelation, John petitioned God for understanding of what he was seeing, and he petitioned God through prayer. And in between Adam and John are countless prayers from men and women who knew that the best thing they could do when they face challenging circumstances, was to pray. Always pray. Prayer is the one means whereby we communicate with God and God communicates to us. It's not intended for, for prayer is not intended for us to only be a one-way conversation. I get, I get weary of people who say, you're not really praying because I don't hear you crying and moaning and belly aching to God for the whole 45 minutes that you're on your knees. Well, that's not what God ever intended. First off, God never intended prayer to be a 45. See, I told you, this is a good opportunity for a pastor to get to talk to you. God never intended for prayer to be a 45-minute session where you cry and moan continually. There are times when intercession takes place, and that's a different type of prayer. My daily prayer time should not be listened to. My daily prayer time should not be 45 minutes of me wailing and crying. It shouldn't be. 
if, if, because that's my communication to my Savior. That's my daily time of communication to my God. If my wife, every time she talked to me, cried and whined and wailed, she might have a different husband. She might have a different husband. Sometimes in our communication, I need to talk to her. And sometimes she needs to talk to me. In my daily communication with God, my daily communication with God needs to be a communication. I need to talk to God. I need to tell God I love God. I need to petition God. I need to tell God the things that I'm worried about. I need to ask God to protect my children and my grandchildren in school. I need to ask God to keep my wife safe and, and all of the things that I pray about. I need to pray about every person that's in this, in this church. I need to pray about every empty seat in this church. God didn't put them here for them to be empty. God put them here so that they'll be filled. So I need to pray to God to do that. But then I also pray. When I pray, I ask God to direct. And I'm not perfect. But, 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 but when I pray, I ask God to direct my steps today and lead me today and guide me today and help me today to be what he's called me to be and help me to be an example in front of somebody who needs an example of what it means to be a child of God, a disciple of Jesus Christ. I ask God, you may not, maybe it might help some of you to do this every now and then, but I ask God to guard my tongue. I ask God to help me to say things that are going to, when I pray before Sunday service, when I come in here uh, and, and, and spend time praying before Sunday service, I ask God to let everything that's said and done in our service edify the body of Christ. I ask God to let every song we sing, every word that's spoken, everything that's done, every person that stands in front of this body, I ask God to let it edify the church and lift us up. <clears throat> and then I sometimes I just, when I'm in my prayer time, some people might not think this is proper, but you do what you're going to do. I'm just telling you what I do. I've got, a, I've got a Bible on my phone, and I'll pray a while. And then I'll sit down and I'll, I'll uh, open up my Bible on my phone and I'll read through some scripture. And if there's a scripture that hits me pretty hard, and sometimes God just has a way of doing that, and I get a scripture that hits me pretty hard, I'll get back down and I'll pray for a couple minutes. Oh God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, oh God. Don't let me try to be a pleaser of men. Let me please you, God. And then I might read a little more, and then I might get inspired. And on Mondays, when we're here for an hour on Monday morning prayer, sometimes I get inspired, and I'll study a little something, and I'll, and I'll type it up, and I'll write it, and I'll throw it on my Facebook page. So other people can maybe read it. Maybe it can bless somebody else. Because when I pray, I pray, God, let my life Bless somebody who needs a blessing today. So <clears throat> we got to understand, prayer is not a, a means where only I talk to God. Prayer is a means where God can also communicate to me. If you don't pray, if you don't pray, you don't give God a means to communicate to you. I'll say that again. If you don't pray, you don't give God a means to communicate with you. God can't do in your life what needs to be done if you don't pray. So I guess maybe we could ask, how do you how do you uh, how do you describe prayer in your own words? What do you think people uh, why, why is it, do you, do you think that people maybe don't pray as often as they should? When we gather together to worship, corporate prayer is part of the worship experience. You need to remember something about prayer. 
thy word is a lamp unto my feet, light unto my path. That's why I read scripture when I pray. Because that enlightens. That's like turning a light on in the conversation. It's one thing, I guess, to sit in a room that's, that's dark and talk to somebody. But it's another thing to turn a light on so that you can see them. The word of God is a lamp unto our feet. And it's a light to our path. So I, I firmly believe, I really believe that the word of God ought to be part of your prayer time. I think there ought to be in your prayer time a time where you read a chapter or a couple of verses at least of God's Word because it turns the light on in your conversation. (coughs) Prayer helps us to focus on things that really matter. Prayer helps us to focus on those things that really matter. We were told that we should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things uh, would be added unto us. You need to remember something. Nobody else can take your place in prayer. When Brother Hunt pastored, Brother Hunt used to have, um, oh, from Martinsville, isn't that awful? Sister uh, Potter, Sister Potter used to come all the time. No, I shouldn't say all the time. Brother Hunt had Sister Potter come and and preach a lot. Sister Potter did a lot of preaching. She preached camps, did children's camps, did a lot of things, and had a very unique perspective on a lot of things. Good lady, great lady. Sister Potter made the statement almost every time she was here, I think, that uh, really impressed me about Sister Potter. Sister Potter said, if you don't pray, for your family, who do you think will? So you bring that all into perspective and you stop and think about Jesus told Nicodemus, except you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. So we believe that this is the way to heaven. And that if people are going to go to heaven, they have to experience this. And I don't want any of my family to be lost. If I don't pray for my family, who do I think is going to pray for my family? Well, you can always count on Brother Long and Sister Long. Okay. (laughs) But you need to pray for your family. It's important that you understand that we, nobody can take your place. The, the prayer that I pray is the shepherd's prayer. It's not the mother's prayer or the father's prayer or the brother's prayer or the sister's prayer. And I'm not taking your place. Just because I'm praying doesn't mean that you don't have to. I'm not taking your place in prayer. Prayer helps us focus on what really matters. And I believe that prayer is a necessity when we make big choices. When we're choosing some, I've said this more than once, there are people in this building that are smarter than I am. There are people in this building that have higher IQs than I have. There are people in this building that make more money than I make and have more degree. I don't have any degrees except that 10 or 98.6. That's the only degrees I got. There are people who have more degrees in this building than I do. And they ask me about jobs and cars. Should I take this job? Should I buy this car? We're thinking about getting a car. What should we do? The Bible is full of examples of people that prayed before they made major decisions. The Bible is also full of people who made major decisions before they prayed. And there's a stark difference between the results and the outcome of those that prayed first versus those who acted first. When Moses made his second journey up Mount Sinai, prayer was foremost in his mind. He knew he had to hear from God before he approached the people again. And it was a pivotal moment in the history of Israel. The sin of building the golden calf had been committed and God had judged it. And Moses, when he realized the anger of God, 
and what it could cause to destroy Israel, he went back up the mountain and he interceded for Israel with God. And during his prayer time, he spoke these words. If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up from hence. God had declared that he would bring his people to to Canaan land. Moses realized how enormous the decision that Israel had made was and how hard it was going to be for him to try to lead these rebellious people. And he refused to go one step further without getting an answer from God in prayer. If you don't go with us, we're not taking another step, God. He would not simply give in to what his flesh wanted to see happen without engaging God in prayer. He wasn't going to give in. He wasn't going to do anything until he first sought God. He sought God first. Moses' successor, Joshua, also recognized his need for prayer. And during a battle, one of the... uh, one of the army of Israel absolutely had to win. Joshua paused and he sought God in prayer. He sought God in the face of adversity. When the sun was beginning to set and darkness was approaching, he realized they were facing a huge challenge. If the sun went down, it would allow the enemy to slip in and the possibility that they would destroy them. And So he he could have resigned himself to nature and the hopelessness of losing a battle, but instead he prayed for God to intercede on their behalf. And he became, Joshua became emboldened enough in his prayer while he was confronting this challenge that he was facing that he looked at the sun and he commanded the sun to stand still. And the Bible lets us know that his prayer was effective because in Joshua 10, 13, the Bible said, And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. It is, is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. Joshua refused to try and work his way out of a situation on his own when he could pray and God could help him through it. So even in the most dire of circumstances, even in the worst circumstances that we face in our life, biggest decisions that we have to make, prayer is the direction that we should take. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, David, we read the account of David, and um, David was going to prayer after the Philistines challenged him. Uh, in the valley of Rephaim, and uh, he had just been anointed king, and the Philistines were seeking uh, an opportunity to to have him killed and overthrown. Uh, Probably, I would think, I don't know, maybe you don't think this way, but I would think that would be an enormous weight on David's shoulders and (coughs) probably struck fear in the heart of David. It was the type of fear that could drive a man into hiding. David had already hidden once in the face of danger. Already knew what it was like to be in danger. And it seemed the, 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 um, the, the, this future that God had promised to David, this, this, this kingdom that David would rule over, was about to be taken away from him before it ever even started. And instead of hiding in fear, in, in 2 Samuel 5.23, the Bible said, David inquired of the Lord in the face of death, David went to God in prayer. I see it sometimes. I got a friend, Tony McCall. He pastors a church in Arkansas and uh, went to the hospital, and there was an elder in his church uh, that was in the hospital dying. And uh, uh, Brother McCall took a picture uh, and, and posted it on his Facebook page on social media. This is the kind of thing you're supposed to put on Facebook. And Brother McCall put a picture on his Facebook page of this elderly man. You could see that he was not in great shape. Laying in a hospital bed with one hand up and someone holding his hand up in the air. And Brother McCall said, drawing the last breaths of his life, 
we sang songs about God and he talked in tongues with his hand in the air. Uh, in, in those dire moments, when you're facing reality, when you're facing life and death situations, when you're afraid beyond what you can even put to pen, when you don't know what's going to happen, uh, instead of running and hiding in fear, David inquired of the Lord. David sought God. In the face of death, he went to God in prayer. And he went with an open heart and an open mind. To pray without either one could have caused him to miss the plan of God. When we pray, when we talk to God, especially about big decisions, we can't go to God and say, God, you know I really want this Lexus, Lord. You know I really want to drive a Lexus, God. I'd do almost anything, God, if I could get a Lexus. So I'm just asking you to smile on me right now and make a way that I can get this Lexus. You know, we need to pray and ask God, God, I, I don't know what tomorrow holds, and I don't know what my job holds, and I don't know what this crazy economy holds, and I don't know what you've got for me in the future, and I don't want to do anything, God, that's going to mess up what you've got planned for me tomorrow. So I'm going to ask you, God, that if this is what you want for me, then God, let this door open. And if it's not, God, let this door close and let me not stand here trying to find a key that unlocks it. And that's the way, really, we should pray about major decisions in our lives. That's the way we should pray about things that are going on in our lives. Um, and, and when David sought God, when he sought God, the Bible says when he inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind thee and come up them over against the mulberry trees. God said, David, you've got a plan, but I've got a better plan. I'm going to tell you something. God's plans are never wrong. God's plans never take us to defeat God's plans never put us in worse shape than we were when we started the battle that we're in. God will always lead us the way he wants us to go, and God wants what's best for us. So God will always take us. He won't always take us the easiest way, but God will always take us the best way. God won't always take us the easiest. I feel like I'm dragging a 100-pound block behind a plow this morning through here. God won't always take us the easiest way, but he will always take us the best way. Because he knows what is best for us. And he knows the way that we take. And he knows the end from the beginning. And his ways are above our ways. And so sometimes the plan that we have for ourselves is not the plan that God has for us. I was pretty sure I was going to be president someday. But God had other plans, right? God has other plans for us. God has other plans for us. And there's no sense for us to try to usurp our authority over what God's plan is. It, we've got to be careful that we know that God is in control of our lives. And, and God said this, Let it be when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of those mulberry trees. That's when you begin to stir yourself. For then, that's when the Lord will go before you to smite the host of the Philistines. Sometimes in our following God's plan, the greatest obstacle that we have in our following of God's plan is waiting on the Lord. God said, I don't want you to go up and over the hill and into the valley to fight the Philistines. I want you to go back around behind and go around that mulberry patch over there, those mulberry trees. And when you get in the mulberry trees, just wait. Don't raise your swords. Don't start the battle cry. You know, just wait on me. How am I going to do it? 
God said, when you begin to hear, see, and isn't it funny? God didn't say, I'm going to blow a great trumpet. Gabriel's going to blow a horn, and when you hear it, it's going to be a fierce battle cry that will stir the enemy and scare the pants off of them. God said, well, here's the way it's going to work. I'm going to have a little rustling in the tops of the mulberry trees. And when you hear that little rustling, that's when you go. But you're not going to have to worry about it because I'm already going to have confused the enemy, and you're not even going to have to fight. It's all part of my plan. I've got it all worked out. You just wait for the rustling in the mulberry. Huh? So David goes to his army and he says, we're not going to take our trumpets. We really probably don't need to take our swords and our staves and our spears. We aren't going to need our shields. We're not going to need any of that. We're going to go hang out in the mulberry trees. <laughs> what? Yeah. We're going to hang out in the mulberry trees and wait on God. It always doesn't sound like it's the greatest thing. It always doesn't sound like it's the way that it ought to work. But that's what God told David. Go hang out in the mulberry trees and wait for the wind to blow. And when it does, I'm going to fight the battle and you just step out and see if you win. And Moses, or Moses, David didn't lose a soldier. David didn't have to kill anybody. And God won the battle for him because God always has a plan. And if we're not careful, we'll, we'll lose sight of the idea that uh, uh, this thing works in, in our lives. The Word of God, if, if we're not careful, the Word of God will become hollow and hard to understand without consistent, fervent prayer. It don't make sense. I can't pray. That? I can't go. I'm a, I'm a warrior. I, I fight with swords and shields and helmets. You know? That's why I tell my kids whenever they got come up against something. And my girls didn't go to college when right after they graduated. They all waited till after they had a house full of kids and house payments and full-time jobs and all that stuff. And, and there were days when... <coughs> going to college, you know, trying to go to college and cook dinner for kids and take care of husbands and do laundry and all of that stuff. They would say, oh, man, I don't know if it's worth it. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I, it was so much fight. And I'd grit my teeth and I'd talk like this and I'd say, you listen to me, young lady, you're along and we don't quit. Quit is not in our vocabulary. We're not quitters. We're fighters. You buckle down. You square your shoulders. You set your face forward, and you move on, and you get that degree. You hear me? You're not quitting. Because that's the way we live. That's our life. We're not quitters. And if you need help, we'll come help you. But you're not pound. You're not quitting. Because that's the way we want to handle everything. We want to fight because that's, you know, that's our lifestyle. That's what we do. We've got, a, we've got an answer for everything. But sometimes giving in to God. My wife wanted to be a nurse, and she went into nursing school. We were in revival. The year she was in nursing school, we were in revival 48 out of 52 weeks. That's the truth. Every night, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we had service. Every night. She worked a full-time job. We had a daughter. And she was going to nursing school. She got her pictures taken with her funny little nurse hat on. Down to the last class. And um, failed the last class. Great grades and everything except that last class. And she failed that last class. She failed that class because she came to church and, and didn't stay home to study. Didn't stay home to study for that last class. So her hope and dream of being a nurse flew out the window. But we put God first. We put God first. And so immediately, some wacko crazy doctor came up to her and said, Vicki, I'm going to start a sleep lab at the hospital and I can't promise you 
that it'll ever pan out to anything, but I, you're a, a respiratory therapist. I want you to come and work with me and help me do the research. And before it all shook out, my wife's speaking all over the country in co conferences, telling people about pediatric sleep. My wife ran the pediatric sleep lab at Riley, developed the whole program in the hospital, set it all up. Because God had a bigger plan than her wearing that funny little white hat. And it doesn't make sense even now, you know, because now she's selling real estate. But now it's the season in our life where it makes sense for her to be here every day. And the Lord's made a way for her to be here every day where if she was still at that hospital, that wouldn't have happened. And I just look at it and I see, oh, God. You know, putting you first and asking you what you want in our lives and asking you to direct our steps and asking you to tell us what you want in us and from us and through us has enriched our lives, blessed us, and made us more than what we could have ever made of ourselves. If she had gone to nursing school, she would still probably be cleaning up blood and sticking needles in people's arms in the emergency room. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but God took, took her on a journey that, that just was so much more enlightening and enriching for her than if she'd have done what she started. And so, you know, prayer. You, I can't overemphasize enough to you this morning the importance of daily prayer in your life. I can't overemphasize enough to you this morning the importance of, of petitioning God before you ever make a decision. I can't overemphasize enough to you this morning the importance of making sure that you don't just spend all your time just belly aching and wailing to God, that you listen to God to give you an answer to the petition that you need. Sometimes we could spend more time crying about what the problem is than letting God tell us how he's going to solve the problem for us. I got these Philistines, God, and I don't know what I'm going to do, and I got to go to battle, and we're going to lose, and the sun's going to come down, and they're going to overtake us. And God said, go hang out in the mulberry bushes. God has always got a plan. We've got to be willing to follow God's plan. Stand with me. So, Prayer is a necessity. It's a vital thing. It is a necessity. Uh, of all the scriptural examples of praying in the face of challenges, none are more impacting than the prayers of Jesus when he didn't know what to do. The Savior of the world knelt and asked for direction in the most critical times of his life. So I think it would, it would benefit us. Um, the focus of this lesson, we find Jesus spending an entire night in prayer before he selected the 12 apostles. That was probably one of the most impacting decisions that he made in his life. He knew the effects of the decision. He knew one of them was going to betray him. Now, my carnal nature, and I'm going to quit, but my carnal nature, if God revealed to me, I'm picking 12 and one of them is going to betray me. My carnal nature would be, then I'm just going to eliminate him and I'm going to pick another one now. I'm going to get a good one instead of having that bad one there. But there was a lesson that the church had to learn from the bad one that was there. And we would never have learned the lesson. We never would have seen the love of the Savior. We ne would have never seen the, 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 the decision that Peter made, all of the things that happened. Jesus didn't really go down a checklist to decide which 12 he was going to choose. He didn't choose the ones that would be his own personal preference. And neither did he just randomly pick them. He didn't do any of those things. What he did was he spent an entire night in prayer. He submitted his flesh to the Spirit in order to make the right decision. If Jesus, God manifest in flesh, knew that he had to pray when he faced a challenge, how much more should you and I pray when we have decisions that we have to make? Prayer needs to be an important part of your life as a child of God. 
as a disciple, prayer needs to be the first part of your life every day. Amen. It's about 10 till. Take about 10 minutes, and we're going to start Mother's Day morning worship service today. Amen. God bless you.